You ready? Yes. All right. Good evening, everyone out there in, I guess, <laughs> I don't know what you'd call it, but we're glad you are tuning in. If you are, hope you had a good day in the Lord and I hope you enjoyed the services this morning. Uh, we got a lot of compliments, both of Brother Aaron and myself, on the messages, and we appreciate that. Uh, it's good to hear. Uh, it's good to hear that somebody is listening. But we are glad you're back with us tonight. We're going to be blessed with Brother Jan in a few moments. But before he comes, I want to uh, renumerate a few announcements that I made this morning. I uh, got an email from. Chris Weaver, uh, Milo's daughter, and uh, they were at the airport, said they saw the service, enjoyed the message this morning. And, then, and so I want to give you um, a new address. Uh, on my blog, I put the address in Ohio. I thought they were going to be staying up there for a while, but they are coming pretty well, coming right back after the funeral. So if you you would like to send them a card, and I, I'm I'm urging the church, please, who wherever you are, make an effort to get a card off to Cindy and the family. You can put it Cindy and the family, and let them know that the church family is uh, upholding them and praying for them. Brother Milo and Cindy loved our church, and uh, so uh, I'm encouraging you. Uh, please get a card off. But send it to, of course, Cindy Weaver and the family, however you'd want to do that. Here's the net address. 2132 Beneva, B-E-N-E-V-A, Road, R-O-A-D, Sarasota, Florida, 34232. That's where you, you should send the cards because they're coming back down here and evidently going to be down here for a good while. So if you will, this, this week sometime, uh, the service will be up there in Ohio Tuesday at 11 o'clock. It's going to be a graveyard service, uh, semi-private. Of course, they're going to have some folks come in, but it's for the family they're in. And then as I announced this morning, I'm still excited today that we have decided that we're going to open up the church next Sunday on Mother's Day, uh, 9.30 for the Bible class, 10.30 for the preaching hour. And again, we're going to be following the guidelines that our governor set out. We'll be following the space between uh, each person for a while. No hugging, no kissing, and no shaking hands. <laughs> and so uh, we'll do that for a while I guarantee you around here that that's not going to last too long uh, but uh, we will we will force ourselves to do what we can to keep everybody safe and let me emphasize again tonight if you do not feel comfortable in coming do not feel like anybody is going to be judging you or complaining about that if if you don't feel comfortable, stay home until you do feel comfortable uh, there. Also, if you want to, if you, it's up to you. If you want to wear a mask, that's, uh, that's okay. You can, you can wear a mask. Uh, I, for one, will not be wearing one, but you can wear one if you want to uh, on it. So I think that pretty well covers everything as I look here. Uh, on it. Uh, I'm excited about us getting ready to resume the services. We're going to get the word out this week. We're going to try to call everyone on our church directory and let them know that the church will reopen and everybody's welcome and encourage them to invite somebody. And let's, I'd like to start off with a bang. I mean, a real bang, but we'll see how it goes. We're not, we're not interested in that being the criteria, but I'd like to do that. But anyway, it's been a good day, and uh, I've enjoyed uh, preaching to you, and there, Brother Aaron enjoyed preaching to you. Now tonight, Brother Jan, I don't know whether he's going to enjoy preaching to you or not. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll say, he get, I'm going to enjoy hearing him. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 
uh, there. So I'll turn the service over to Brother Jan and sit back, get your Bible, let God speak to you. Let's open to just a little word of prayer tonight. Father, we come to the throne of grace and we thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for this day, this beautiful Lord's Day that you've given us. We pray for our church, our people, especially we're mindful right now of Cindy and the family. And God, you be with them and comfort them and look upon them and keep them safe. And Lord, I know you, you watch over them as they travel, as they fly. Uh, we just pray for uh, Jerry and, and uh, uh, Chrissy and Tiffany. God, just pray for them, be with them, as well as Cindy today. Pray for the service tonight. Pray that you'll bless Brother Jan. Oh, God, what a good message he brought last time. And I pray you'll anoint him tonight to give us the message God wants us to have. And, and we can fill our, our hearts full of being in God's house tonight. Bless now this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Jan, if you'll come, it's a joy tonight to have you with Good us. Church. Amen. I'm excited. Sounds like we're going to have services back in the church again next Sunday. I'm a little disappointed, and there's uh, no hugging, no kissing, and, uh, and, and no shaking of hands, but uh, I guess I'll have to wait. It's good to be here tonight. I'm glad that I've had this opportunity. I brought a little something special along with me. So many of you enjoy good music, and I do too. I enjoy singing along with this young lady uh, when we're home and in the kitchen or wherever we might be. It's fun just to sing along with her. So come, if you would come, please, and share your song with us. Excuse me. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is he. Bow down before him. Love and adore him. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. Amen. I miss Bob playing for me. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. I'll be sure glad when... Uh, when they open up the barber shops and the beauty shops. I, I've tried to fix my hair. I can't do a thing with it. It's been so long since I've had to comb it. Yeah, I know. I got to brush it down on the sides. But when you keep your hair short, you don't worry about combing or any of that other stuff. And when it gets longer, all of a sudden, yeah, you need to be doing it. Need to be doing it. Well, I said it was good to be here. Let's open with a word of prayer and we'll get into the word of God. Father, we are truly thankful that we can be here tonight. We're thankful that your hand has been upon each and every one of our members. That you have kept us from this virus as it is. That your hand is always upon us and your eyes are always upon us. And we are sheltered by your wing. So, Father, I'm asking tonight, if you would, take the message that you have given me. 
the one that you have shown me how to write. And Father, use it to bring honor and glory to your name. Use it to touch some hearts, some lives, somewhere with the message of the salvation that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless now this message. Anoint my lips. Use me for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to start out tonight in the Gospel of John. I'm going to give you a little start so you can go find your place if you wish. We'll be in the Gospel of John and in chapter 10. Gospel of John, chapter 10. Now we will bounce around, but I won't force you to go chase it around in your Bibles. I can't tell when you get there, so I'll have to just continue and go on. Besides, I don't want to use up the whole evening. Chapter 10 of the Gospel of John. As all of you, or many of you at least, know, the, the John is one of four Gospels in the Bible. There are 66 books. Four of them are considered to be the Gospels. This Gospel of John is the only Gospel that is not considered to be a synoptic Gospel. Synoptic gospel is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason they're called synoptic is because they have similarity in composition and in structure. John's different. John is totally different. Each of these gospels, as we look at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ from a different viewpoint, and you've probably heard it said that Matthew looks at the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ as him being the king or the Messiah. Mark, on the other hand, features him as the servant. Oftentimes he's referred to as the suffering servant. Luke looks at him as the man. The man. And then John sees him as the divine, the son of God, God incarnate. Now, as we turn to chapter 10, and if we read it, and I, I'm assuming that many of you have probably already read it. I will not read it completely through. It's a little bit on the lengthy side, and we're only going to look at a small portion of it. But John chapter 10 involves the use of an analogy that is very familiar to the people of that time. Most knew all about sheep. And they knew all about shepherding. So this was nothing new to them when they heard these parables as is the first uh, seven ver or six verses of this uh, book or chapter. It is a parable. It talks about uh, the uh, uh, place where the sheep stay or the, um, my brain just went flat, but sheepfold is what I want to say. And it talks about the doorkeeper of the sheep. And it tells us uh, in the chapter, or excuse me, uh, verse uh, seven, it speaks of Jesus Christ as being the door of the sheepfold. Uh, up at the top, it refers to uh, being denying access to those that are not part of that fold. And we're not going there tonight, and I don't mean to linger on that, but I, I do want to bring it to your attention that Jesus is looked upon as the door. Verse 9 says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The only way you're going to get into the sheepfold, the only way you're going to get into the family of God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know as well as I do, many of you have heard it before, uh, this verse of Scripture that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Anyway, the people of this time, 
the people of this era, they knew sheep. Sheep had been a large portion of their heritage for a long, long time. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 2, we see that Abel was a keeper of sheep. In Genesis chapter 31, we read of Jacob, who labored as a keeper of the flocks for his father-in-law Laban. Fourteen years he worked for Laban in order to marry Rachel. David, as seen in Samuel, was a man after God's own heart. Before he was king, he tended the flocks of Saul. He was a simple, poor shepherd. And David said unto Saul, Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. David was a simple shepherd, simple shepherd. And for you and I, it pays to gain some familiarity with the context of, of these verses in chapter 10. It always is dealing with the sheep here. We're dealing with the shepherds. We're dealing with the sheepfold. And we're dealing with the individual sheep. It pays to be familiar. The people of this area and this time, as I have said previously, uh, knew what sheep herding was all about. Brother Cowardin, who's seated here in what small audience we might have, but that's okay. I have a bigger audience somewhere out there, and that's good. Um, Brother Cowardin has been to Israel. At least I understand you have, and you've told about this, and you have mentioned it in some of your sermons in, uh, sermons in times past uh, about this relationship with the sheep and how the... Uh, you know, how the shepherds and the sheep interact with each other. And, and I have heard preaching that, that deals with this same thing and, and about the teachings that concern this particular passage. But, you know, I, I probably never really stopped and thought about what this passage is telling me. What does this passage say to me? I've never contemplated the relationships of sheep and shepherds. And thinking on that as I prepared for this sermon, I took advantage of YouTube. Not that I'm inclined to go to electronics that heavily, but YouTube provided what I was looking for. I saw a video of some shepherds. And there were like five or six different shepherds, and they were all standing out in the, in the field, and the sheep were grazing up on the hillside. And the one, one shepherd comes up and he calls to the sheep and, and pff, sheep are like my dog. They didn't pay any attention. Didn't pay any attention. And two or three more came up to do the same thing. And the sheep did not pay any attention whatsoever. And then another man stepped up. He called out to the sheep and every head of every sheep turned and looked. They knew his voice. Amen. And not only did they turn and look, but they came. They came. They came down to the shepherd. And then you saw as the, as the uh, little clip closed out, the shepherd was starting to walk off towards a, another direction. And all of the sheep formed up behind him and followed him out. And that we need to remember as we look at our portion of Scripture tonight. We're going to go to John chapter 10, verses 27 
to 30. John chapter 10, verses 27 to 30. This is what it says. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Let's look at the first part of that scripture. My sheep hear my voice. Now that speaks to me of a personal possession. They're not his sheep or they're not his sheep. They're my sheep. Who's speaking? If you have your Bibles, you'll see perhaps that, it, you are, that the letters are in red. And that usually is an indication that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is doing the speak. And in this case, that be true. He is. So they are my sheep, his sheep. They belong to him. My sheep hear my voice. If you remember, if you can, um, several weeks ago, I spoke on if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face out of Second Chronicles. I brought to your attention the word, if my people, my people, it talks of possession. Well, in this case, it's my sheep or my people, I mean, my believers, my followers, the church. Amen. This is who he is addressing and only is he addressing those that are his, my sheep. Not that guy's, not this fellow over here, not the church down the street, not the one behind us, my sheep, my sheep. Those which are his do what? They respond to his call. My sheep hear my voice. They respond to his call. No other call but his call. Only his calling will they respond to. And unless you know Jesus Christ personally, you are not of his sheep. Jesus is calling. He's calling, actually calling everyone, but only some will respond. I think of the song that says, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O sinner, come home. Jesus is calling. He's calling everyone. He's looking for you and he's looking for me. If you're a member of his sheephold, you'll hear his voice and follow him. My sheep hear my voice. They belong to him. They're his. Those sheep that hear him and those sheep that follow him belong to him. They are his sheep. There's his sheep by possession, by ownership. He owns us. He created us. He created us. That's the old. He created us. Here's a duplication of creation. He owns us. He created us. 
He created us again after the first birth, which was by natural birth. He created us again when we became Christians. We experienced a new birth. We became new creatures. We are his workmanship. Nicodemus wanted to know about this. He wanted to know how you could do that. I don't know. I'm going to, I'll read you the verse of scripture, but I don't watch TV that much. I really don't. I, I can't find a whole lot on there that I really truly like too much. But my son steered me on to a little series that's started. And it, you've got to do it with YouTube and not YouTube, but with a website or a, a, what do you call, I don't know what you call it when it's on your cell phone. But anyway, that's what it is. It's a, it's a little series called The Chosen. I, 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 I'm really fascinated with the series. It's very accurate, it seems. It seems very accurate in its presentation. Of course, you realize that they have to take some poetic license here and there to make things flow together the way they want them to. But it seems to be accurate in all of its presentation. And from what I can tell, what I have seen, they are presenting the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've only seen the first of the series, and there's supposed to be several. But it is what interested me a lot was the curiosity that Nicodemus would show in this film. He was curious. He wanted to know what these people were experiencing and what had happened to each of them because they were changed. Nicodemus wanted to know. In John chapter 3, verses 3 to 5, Nicodemus was speaking with Jesus, and Jesus answered him, and he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. When I was a younger Christian, younger preacher, we used to say born twice, die but once. Born the second birth, only experience one death. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So, there is a duplication of creation. We are to be born twice. That's an affirmation of the ownership of Jesus Christ. We have a new life. We are a new person. The affirmation of this ownership by Jesus Christ is that we are a gift from God. The Bible says, the Father which gave them me. We are the gifts of his Father's love. We are the gifts that he, has, Jesus, has been entrusted with through the process of salvation. We are purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. He laid down his life for us. What a sacrifice. He redeemed us from the curse of the law and from sin. And not only that, we're, we're, we are part of, part of what he owns. We are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. We are the sheep of his pasture. If you would, I'm going to, I like, I like a verse, uh, and I want to share if I can, if I didn't lose it already. 
It's in Psalms. Psalms 100. Short, five verses. This really spoke to me. It says, make a joyful noise. That's Psalms 100, verses 1 to 5. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Now hear this. Knowing ye that the Lord be, he is God. It is he that hath made us. And not we ourselves. We are what? His people and the sheep of his pasture. We are his possession. We are the sheep of his pasture. We are his. We're a special property. Did you know? I already told you that we've been purchased. As wide and as vast as God's dominion is, the fact that he rules over everything, the fact that his that the universe is his estate, his property is infinite. He owns it all. But believers, believe it or not, are his only purchased possession. He paid the ultimate price in the sacrifice of his son. Shed blood upon the cross of Calvary for you and I. God paid that price. So we are a valuable commodity. We've been purchased at an infinite cost, and that's the blood of Christ. He knew our worth when he made the purchase. And we are his special treasures. We are his jewels. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Hey, how about that? He knows his sheep. He knows you and you. And he knows me. When Jesus calls me home, whether it's by the clouds or the clods, I somehow think he's going to call me by name. He knows me. And if you're born again and belong to Jesus Christ, he knows you. He knows every hair on your head. I can't help think when Jesus Jesus called Lazarus by name when he said, Lazarus, come forth. I kind of think, and I may be adding something to the scripture, and I'm not supposed to do that, but the Bible says in the book of Revelation, come up hither and I'll show you things to come. Somehow I think he said, hey, John, come on up here. I need to talk to you. I want to show you some things. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share, when his chosen ones shall gather to their homes beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. He's going to call you by, his, by your name. He's going to say, Brother Cowardin, come on up here. I want to talk to you. Brother David, Sister Marilyn, yep. going to call you by name. He knows every one of our names. He knows every one of our names. So he knows us. We're his. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And subsequently, what? They follow me. Ah, there's a mutual recognition between the sheep and the shepherd. They follow me. 
I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take the cross and follow me. Where he leads, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I will go with him, with him, all the way. They follow him. They, they know who he is. And they follow, they leave the grassy fields and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? For us as believers, maybe that's what we ought to be doing. We're living in the lap of luxury. We have what we need. Three squares a day, car, good job. We still need to be following the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to follow him. If we follow him, you're going to find that he reciprocates to us. We do what he tells us. He tells us that, you're, we, that we are his sheep and he knows us and that we follow him. And Jesus offers something in return. If you'll see it in the verse of scripture that we read. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says that they follow me and I do what? I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Jesus offers us a form of personal protection, a promise to us, something good for being his sheep. I like Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Jesus gives us a promise. Jesus tells us that he is our Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You hear that? I shall not want. Trust in him. Trust and obey, the song says. There's no other way. And what's he say? He says, if you go with him and follow him, that he will give you eternal life. I want you to listen to the word. I will give unto them eternal life. Not I will give them, but I will give unto them eternal life. You know, it's not a maybe kind of proposition. It's not maybe I'm going to give you eternal life or maybe I'm not, depending on how I feel this day. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll uh, see how you behave. Maybe I'll wait and figure out uh, if you're going to really mean this or if you're just talking through your hat. Let me check your demeanor. Let me find out. No, it's not that. It's not that at all. I give unto them eternal life. Amen. It's a gift. It's a gift. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. John 5, 24 continues and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life 
and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. That is an authoritative assurance. That's a pledge on the part of God. They shall never perish. Never is an inclusive term, just like the term all is. Throughout all the eons of eternity, you may perish the thought of ever perishing. Never, in this case, means forever. Amen. Never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That word any refers to any power, any power whatsoever. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. No power can snatch them away, man or demon. It's a de declaration that no man, however eloquent in, in, in his speech, no matter how persuasive he might be, no matter how sly he might be in an argument or mighty in his rank, no devil with all of his malice and his power and his cunning or his allurements is able to pluck them from the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. To pluck is to rob, to seize or to carry away as a robber. Jesus holds them so securely and so tightly and so certainly that no enemy can make an escape with them. No foe can surprise him or overcome him by force. We are held tightly in his hand. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. It goes on and says, my father, which gave them to me, is greater than all. And no man shall pluck them out of my father's hand. And you can see some comparison there. Jesus, and we're going to look at this in a little bit, in a few minutes. Jesus is making the same claim about himself as he's making about God. No man can take them from me, and no man can take them from my Father, which is greater than all. I am persuaded. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You ask me perhaps tonight, some of you maybe that are listening and you think, ah, you believe in that phrase that says once saved, always saved? And I'm going to say to you, yes, sir. Amen. I do. Yep. It's yep. Bible. If you believe this book, and that is what you should believe. No man can take them out of his hand. No man. So we have some security, major security there. Christ's knowledge of the sheep corresponds with God's recognition of his supreme claims. The activity, the, the act of trust, I should say, is rewarded by the greatest gift that God could ever give us. And that's the gift of salvation that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's our indisputable birthright. It is guaranteed by his limitless authority and his power to protect us. It would be an immense perversion. For us to look at this passage in any other light. It is our undeniable birthright on the grounds, and, 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 and you cannot deny this birthright on sometimes the simple grounds is, oh, I have sinned. We are saved how, my friends? We are saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. I cannot do anything to earn this salvation. 
except follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're here tonight and, and, and you haven't made that decision, and, and, and there's a little more that I want to say yet, but I, I think this is a good spot for me to stop. I think we need to speak about your decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've not made that decision, now is the right time. Now is the time to do it. I'm not going to know unless you write and tell us or send an email or whatever you, you need to do. Yes. If you want to share that with us, that would be great. We'd like to know that. We can pray for you. And when we're back in services, if you're close enough and you can come, we'd like to see your face. We'd like to talk to you. And that's pretty much what I'm going to say. You need to make that decision. If you want to be in the sheepfold that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ and not some other sheepfold, then you need to receive him as your Savior. And the final thing in this whole verse is that God, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. It's not just some tribe or some family. They're equal, equal in power and in knowledge and in authority. It speaks of a unity between the Father and the Son, a oneness in power and nature and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. The pastor talked about the Trinity this morning. Amen. That's part that I just read to you where it says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand and no man shall pluck them out of the Father's hand. It's one hand. They're the same hand. They're the same. In the beginning was the word, according to John chapter 1, and the word was with God, and what? The word was God. Amen. Now, this upset the religious leaders of his day. It made them mad. They called him blasphemous. Jesus said to them, Say, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, Thou blasphemest, because I said I'm the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. The religious leaders of that day took that as blasphemy, and they sought to stone him. He was declaring himself to be equal with God the Father. He is God the Father. Amen. God the Father is God the Son, and God the Father and God the Son are the Holy Spirit. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gavest them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to take them out of my Father's hand. My Father and I are one. His sheep see him. His sheep hear them, hear him. His sheep know him, and he knows them, and they follow him. And in this posture of both provision and protection, Jesus provides us with an unshakable and indisputable promise of eternal security. No man, and that means no one, can pluck the child of God the believer out of the hand of God. You, my friend, if you trusted Christ as your personal Savior, have been bought with a price, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this message is here to, first of all, reassure the believer that they have everlasting life. And you cannot lose it. And first of all, again, we are here because 
It is our sincere desire. If you do not know Christ, that you come to him today. Let's just make a simple prayer. If that's your desire, you can ask the Lord Jesus to come into your heart. Amen. Father, we uh, thank you for this opportunity. Our heart reaches out to all who have heard. A believer may rest assured in their promise of eternal security. And for those who may be here tonight, do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would just simply say, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died for me. I believe you shed your blood for me. I believe you wish to forgive my sins. And I'm here because I am a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. May I trust you today. May I experience a change in my life and in my attitude and everything about me. Maybe I be envisioned as a child of God. In Jesus name, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. I tell you, you've heard some real old-fashioned Bible-believing Baptist preaching today. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jan. That was a real encouraging message for God's people. I, I tell you, I'm afraid we take our salvation too much for granted. I'm glad tonight I'm saved. But more than that, I'm not only gl glad I'm saved, I'm glad that I know I'm saved, and I know it's for sure, and it's forever. Amen. Amen. Miss Marilyn, thank you for the good song tonight. <clears throat> we just would remind you as we close down, we will have a uh, live stream Sunday, uh, excuse me, uh, Wednesday night. Uh, Brother Aaron will be... Uh, teaching the lesson again Wednesday night. And then next Sunday morning, we hope to see some of you, if not all of you, to be with us, assembled in God's house. It's just going to be a revival. I, I really, I'm excited about it already. And I'm looking forward to it. And I, I believe it's going to, I believe we, we may have needed this to kind of help us to understand how much we need the church and the church needs us. Amen. And so I, I, I guess I'm getting a little excited early, but I think it's just going to be a glorious service as we resume our service to the glory of God that we will just have a great and wonderful and glorious time together next Sunday morning. And all you uh, precious ladies and mothers, we hope you can be with us and will be with us. We want to recognize you and honor you uh, because I thank God uh, all my heart for the godly women and the godly mothers that we have. Amen. So anyway, it's been good today. It's been good to be here. And we look forward to next week when you may be sitting out there in front of us. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Some of you I haven't seen. I've talked to you. Haven't seen you uh, for a while. So I'm looking forward. It might be just a little bit. I don't mean there, it's a good message. I, but, you know, next Sunday might be just a little bit what it might be like when we meet in heaven in a reunion. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be reunited in, uh, next Sunday together as Berean Baptist Church. And we hope and pray you will be a part of it. May God bless you. And thank you again, Brother Jan. Wonderful message, really, sincerely. I, I don't know. I keep, I try, I'm not trying to give him the big head, but I, he's getting better and better. Gooder and gooder. <laughs> Amen. Has he been practicing on you, Sister <laughs> Marilyn? Amen. Well, anyway, my heart was blessed, and I trust that your, yours were too. God bless you. 
We love our people. We love our church. We love our Lord. And we give him the glory in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a good week. We look forward to seeing you next week. Amen. Amen. Amen.